I'm Allison Bukowski, and this is The Customer X Files. I'm delighted to bring my years of marketing experience to the amazing community that supported me throughout my career. My passion has always been elevating the customer to the focal point of all marketing initiatives, and I'm proud to now lead a marketing organization with a truly customer-led approach. Each episode, I'm joined by an incredible thought leader within the marketing industry, generous enough to share their insights, knowledge, and experience with all of us. Brought to you by the PeerSpot Network, nothing is off limits. And just as our industry continues to evolve, so will this podcast. We will feature guests in live Q&A sessions, panel discussions, and more. So let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Customer X-Files. Today's episode is actually one that's very special and near and dear to my heart, as we're going to talk not only about customer-led growth and customer marketing, but also about being a woman in marketing, being a working mom, and balancing all of this to maintain sanity and still be successful in the workplace. So I am very pleased to be joined by Tietzka DeVry, Global Community Relations Manager at Malwarebytes, TJ, which I will lovingly call her now for the rest of the, of the conversation <laughs> out of just sheer embarrassment that I'm going to mispronounce your name, TJ, but you are, like me, a full-time mom. You are a customer marketer, also a part-time activist, lifelong adhd -er, which I love, and mm -hmm. we're pretty sure you were destined to be a rock star, but then life, it happens, but you mm -hmm. haven't slowed down. You are always very passionate about everything advocacy, professionally speaking, as a customer marketer, and of course, personally, as a human rights advocate. And I, we met uh, a little over a year mm -hmm. ago, and I remember seeing you before we spoke, and I thought, okay, <laughs> that is a woman that I need to get to know, and that hasn't stopped since I've now mm -hmm. learned that your career and your geography are, are just as varied. You were a barista <laughs> in New Zealand. You ran for city councilor in Ireland. You've worked at various tech companies, but have always remained true to the whole people first. So it's not mm -hmm. shocking why you and I got along well. <laughs> and we've bonded over being working moms, discussing the role of women in marketing, mental health awareness, and everything in between. So thank you so much. This is really a treat for me and welcome to the show. Thank you. And this is a real treat for me too. And uh, also a little bit terrifying because I saw that your last podcast was with Kevin Lau. So terrifying, but very excited. You you are on equal equal footing, <laughs> my friend. Uh, Thank you. Heaven is, is amazing, but uh, do not let that detract from all of the incredible <laughs> things that you've been doing. You, you're doing so much. I don't know how you keep all of the plates spinning, but let's let's get into that and talk about it, of course, mm -hmm. but this shouldn't be scary. You know, you're going to have a people before professionals um, icebreaker question. And in the spirit of our conversation, it's simple on the surface and yet not simple at all. What is mm -hmm. your favorite part about being a working mom? Well, you were talking about spinning plates. Um, I spin them and a lot uh, do break like in real life and also <laughs> metaphorically. Um, I just love having both lives. So even I was on maternity for four months. And even though I loved it, I missed that professional life. I missed being that person. And especially when we do have options um, to meet in person, I love having that. I always say like, letting that extroverted chitska out every now and again um and the other part that i love is that and i heard somebody else saying that so i'm i'm just going to copy it um being a mom makes me a better professional and being a professional makes me a better mom so even though it's intense even though there's a lot of mom guilt every now and again it just makes me a better mo a mom and a better professional and what i was thinking yesterday I, I wish I could say it's like, you know, Gregory House from from House, yeah. like when he sees a certain thing, and he's like, oh, this is the solution to, oh, this is the disease this person actually has. So I, I wish it was like that, that every time I see 
my little one doing something that I have a solution to something. Unfortunately, it's not. <laughs> There's no playbook. Even There's no though playbook. as as marketers, we we create them. And it's funny you mentioned mm-hmm. that show because we're watching that with uh, my 14 year old right now uh, going back and watching the episodes. And I loved it when it was on mm-hmm. the first first time around. And I do think the same thing as it wouldn't be nice to just have a brain that can just kind of, you know, work <laughs> through things like that. Unfortunately, being mm-hmm. a, being a parent, not just a mom, but a parent mm. in general is, uh, and I'm like you, I think it does. My hope has always been, even though there was just stacks of mom guilt early mm-hmm. on about, oh, you travel for work, you go away. Yeah. And I would listen to, you know, I don't know. How does your, your husband handle that? I'm like, well, I mean, mm-hmm. he's the dad. I don't know. I say, see you later. <laughs> you know where McDonald's is if you need it. And <laughs> that that's it. And I hope that I wanted my girls to be able to see that, no, you, you can do things. You can do fun things and play in the sandbox at home, but you can also, you know, put on your, your business suit and go, you know, tackle things in another state, travel for work and, yeah. and actually just enjoy what you're doing and mm-hmm. having, having both of those. It's, it's kind of funny. I was never a girly girl, but right. I have been known to take a work call while digging worms out of the dirt when my, <laughs> when my little one was littler. So I, I love it. And what you're saying is indeed, uh, one of the things, and this is the little, little bit of the feminist coming out is that a man is hardly ever asked that question like how do you do it as a dad traveling all the time I have a lot of I was gonna say I have a lot of friends I have a lot of friends who are uh, traveling a lot for work and not a lot of a lot of them get that question so I I just I just don't like being asked that question and especially people from a from a generation above us still see it as like oh you're leaving your child and and she's happy enough like I mean she just when I come back she ignores me for about half an hour and then yes. she's fine <laughs> it's not abandonment it's empowerment quite frankly exactly that, that is how I how I decided to to look at it one because I believe it and two I just needed I needed something mm, to help yeah. me get out get out the door but and what I, you're saying and what you're sorry yeah I, I uh, please, please, sir. please go ahead. What you're saying about like that empowering part. Yes, I, I actually really like that because it is showing your kids that you can basically do anything like nothing holds you back. Not to say that kids hold you back, but you can do what you want to do. And maybe it takes a little bit of time or maybe you do it in a different way. But yeah, it's it's empowering. I'm I'm going to take that with me, actually. Have have at it. It is yours. It is yours to use. And if anyone, <laughs> if you, if you stop listening right now, there, that that's your pearl. You can take it away with you. But hopefully, you you hang with us a little bit here as we transition <laughs> into talking about advocacy. And I'm really curious because as we've gotten to know each other, every time we talk, I learn something new. And you're such <laughs> a fierce advocate for many things. Um, Mm -hmm. in your personal life. So chicken or the egg, which came first? Um, Advocacy professionally or personally? And then just just tell us a little bit about how you got your start in customer advocacy. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I um, went through my old diaries a few months ago and a few years ago as well. um, And I found a kind of a letter to myself when I was about 10. So I think it was 1993. I probably wasn't 19, I was probably uh, 11 years old, but um, I was talking about the Rodney King um, case and what had happened. And this is like 11 year old me going like, this is injustice and and me talking to my parents about this stuff. And I realized that, yeah, from a very young age, I I was an advocate, even like when, when we were younger, you know, we're very involved in like things like Greenpeace, et cetera, you know, setting up uh, stalls, et cetera, in our own little neighborhood. And so I think personally, I've been an advocate for a long time. I've been on, I was going to say on literal barricades when I was a student of student rights. And 
when I veered into kind of like the professional life, um, I think with the start of being in actual technical support, now this goes back a long time, 2009, I think. I think that's where maybe in a little less official way, customer advocacy became very important to me because working in customer support, you realize that it's very important that you are an advocate for customers. And with that, if you're an advocate for your customers, your customers will be advocates for you. And now in 2009, customer advocacy wasn't really a thing yet, I think. Um, but yeah, so I worked in tech support for a long time. I actually really liked it because I am a people person and uh, such a, that's such a cliche, but I am. And I started working for Marovites in 2017, working tech support for a while, uh, worked in social media for a while. And I had this mad idea for myself already to that I wanted to start a consumer um, advocacy program. But it didn't really take off. We already had a B2B um, advocacy program. And when my whole team, I was in the social media team, left, I was, it was only an, an easy segue into the customer advocacy team, which I am right now. When we met last year, I had just transitioned, probably two days before, I think, <laughs> officially. So that's how I got into it. And I think I bring, what I bring to the table is a real understanding of who our customers are, what excites them, especially what, what ticks them off. I was going to use a different word, but um, we are on public. It's a family show. <laughs> it's a family show. Um, so yeah, I, what I bring to the table is that I, I have an understanding of who our customers are and who customers are in, 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 in general, I think, because of my experience in um, tech support and customer support. Um, so yeah, and that's I how I veered into it. I, lo I love that. And I love that you have that background, you know, in mm -hmm. the in the trenches, if you, you know, if you will, because when you think of customer service and support and tech support, you are, I mean, you really get mm -hmm. the raw customer experience, yeah. good, bad, and otherwise. And a lot of times it's, it's, you know, not always the positive, right? Because mm -hmm. there, there's an issue and it needs to be resolved. And I think that's really, I'm not surprised to hear you say that you were an advocate since you were, you know, like, yay tall. I can't see me. I'm <laughs> using my, my hand here to uh, measure, but and I think it's a great question, and I'm going to actually ask that when we push the episode out about what what is everyone's first memory of yeah. being an advocate? Because my guess is we all were probably advocates in our personal mm -hmm. worlds uh, before it became prof you know, professional. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the B2B and B2C. I want to get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. But to kind of launch into that, because you have this experience of working in support, and then moving into advocacy, customer-led growth, customer-led marketing, customer centricity, the, you know, these are all terms that are used right now. You already know that I'm a thousand percent in, mm -hmm. but what do you think in general, like where are companies and organizations missing the mark and where are they getting it right when it comes to this kind of customer-led approach? Well, I think where they're getting it right is is that and you're you're longer in this customer led growth business than I am, but I do feel that it's becoming more important. Um I think the whole customer advocacy business thing is becoming more important. So um companies do understand that, you know, in order to grow, if it is as a company or in order to create amazing products, um, to create amazing service is to listen to customers. And to listen to customers means that you take in their feedback. And with that, if you take in their feedback, improve your services, improve your products, those customers will automatically roll into advocates. 
for instance, even if they weren't advocates before and you had a negative overview of your services or of your product, if you make sure that they feel listened to, if you make sure that they understand that you are doing everything to improve for them, then they, they do turn into advocates. And I think slowly but surely companies do understand that a little bit more that um, having a customer focused strategy is just the way to go. Um, what is not always, um, and this, I think you've heard me talk about this probably a hundred times when we were at Obsess last year, um, international. Um, a lot of customers yeah. and I mm -hmm. a lot of businesses, a lot of uh, are US based, but are also very US centric. So there's a lack of understanding on how how it would work internationally. Um, even for instance, we were talking about MPS scores, for instance. Yes. And how US customers, like in, 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 my, in my experience, it was like, it's either a 10 or it's a one. There's not a lot in between. Dutch people, German people, people from the UK are more like, ah, we'll give it a three or a four. It's not too bad, but there is room for improvement. And I think we need to really look into, um, instead of standardizing these things, we need to look at it a little bit more from like an international perspective as well. And it rolls into, it also rolls into how we do our advocacy. Um, because I think there's culture, a lot of cultural differences. I think it, it, when it comes to like sharing, when it comes to shouting it off the rooftops, like a Dutch person will be less shouting. Off Not going to be shouting. Not going to be shouting <laughs> from the rooftops. Maybe a, maybe a loud whisper. Yeah, very loud, a loud whisper. But they would, for instance, talk to their peers about this stuff, maybe not publicly. So we need to understand that it's not all in the public eye, but it also happens behind closed doors. So that's something that I'm very passionate about within our own company, of course, but also outside. I want Because I'm in Europe, I, I have a good understanding of how these cultures work. So I would like to see a little bit more focus on these cultural differences. Yep. I think you bring up a great, well, many great points, but the global perspective is something that is not always, it, I think it's just assumed that... Mm -hmm. The way that you know we're doing it domestically here, here for me in the United States, that's the way that we're going to roll something mm -hmm. out. And I think it goes to, as you were saying, you know, earlier listening to that feedback. But I think now there's kind of three. The if you're doing nothing, well, then you're just you're in the dark ages, right? If you're not mm -hmm. tapping into customer sentiment, just guess what? They're not. Guess what? Those people aren't listening to this podcast, so who cares? We'll just leave them. <laughs> um, if if you're taking the feedback, good for you, you know, you're doing, that's correct to have that, but now that's not even, you know, good enough. Mm -hmm. It's also acting on the feedback yeah, and making sure that you're creating that, that wheel, right. You're closing the mm -hmm. loop so that you can showcase to customers. Um, I, I asked you, I listened and I acted. Um, exactly. and I think that also has to be part of factored into this global perspective. It's not one size fits all. I know when I talk about building advocacy programs and I've this, the, the one at PeerSpot now is the fifth one or fifth mm -hmm. flavor of program that I've done. None of them are the same because no. it, there's different industries, of course, and personas that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, where are the customers actually located? Right. And yeah. we have to take that into account. So we could we could do a whole nother situation on, you know, global advocacy. Mm -hmm. But part of that too, I think, is back to this B2B and B2C perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um you are super unique because you've done both. And I think mm -hmm. everyone would really like to hear about, all right, talk about it. 
Um, <laughs> how are they similar? How are they different? What makes one unique? Um, and, and how did you kind of land into having to balance both? It's a very interesting one. And it, 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 it has been a, a journey. Let's, let's call it that. Um, so our B2B advocacy program was set up um, by my two team members about three years ago. Worked really well, testimonials, reviews, etc. And so we went in with kind of like, I mean, I've always worked in the consumer business, so I, 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 I kind of had an idea, but I'd never worked in actual customer advocacy. So, so we went in with, with a certain mindset and we noticed quite quickly that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole different ball game. When it comes to getting people to sign up, when it comes to um, people understanding what advocacy is, like um, the B2B program would be more, the IT professionals know a little bit more about what it is about and they signed up pretty easily and um, they're very active. All of them are very active. Um, but with our B2C program, we, it needs a bit more nurturing, I think. Um, we have a lot of advocates in it, um, but it needs a little bit more nurturing and it needs a little bit more, and here we go, understanding of what they expect from an advocacy program. And that's what we're figuring out right now. We're figuring out what, what, re what they really love um, what they really, really don't like. Um, it's just a little bit of a different activity kind. Like, for instance, with our B2B um, program, you know, you ask them if they want to do a review on, on G2 or you ask them if they want to do a review on Captera. You know, you don't even have to ask twice. They do it. <laughs> With our BTC program, it's just slightly different. They need to understand a little bit more about, for instance, what these reviews do for us and what these reviews in the end will do for them as well. Because our reviews, again, we, we listen to our reviews, so we make the program better. And um, so, yeah, it's we're still in the process of really kind of fine-tuning um, the two programs and um, I, I can see a little bit as well that our B2C customers are a little bit more fun and incentive driven. So in order to kind of, and this is going to sound really weird, get them to do a certain task that we would like, if we want some feedback on our product or anything, in order to do it, we need to really approach it from like a fun perspective and put a little bit of an incentive on it, a little bit of a reward or extra points or anything. Whereas the B2B program, it's like you ask, you get. That That's really interesting. And I'm sure when people listen to this, they'll be fascinated because I can, I can already see some people kind of raising an eyebrow that good for you that B2B that they're just, they're doing it. Cause I, I think something mm -hmm. that's a, that's a testament to the program that you yeah. have in place that they're, they don't question, they're willing to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we all want to be right. From an advocacy perspective that you're, it's not pulling teeth and you can actually focus your attention and your energy on delivering a great experience. Yeah. That's where we all want, want to be. I'm curious with the B2C. Um, why, why do you think it is that the incentive has to be there. I don't, yeah, that's a very good question because I've asked myself that many times as well, because I've tried, um, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've tried and tested it in different ways. And I don't know, like it, sometimes they need, just need a little bit more of a push. Um, whereas B2B, maybe they, especially, and I think in our, uh, B2B group is that they've been in the program for a while, uh, a lot of them as well. So they understand the importance of reviews and there's a longevity there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And I was going to ask if maybe that was it, because at least in my experience, and I don't have the same experience as you, mm-hmm. um, my B to C is more in my nonprofit work when I, hmm. when I used to be, you know, and I, and I worked in nonprofit and I've continued to, to volunteer and it's not quite the same, but I treat, mm-hmm. you know, those folks kind of like, you know, consumers where their interaction with you is shorter. It, it, it's yeah. less time. It's more just kind of um, transactional, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so some, maybe that is part of it where, Hey, this is really seen as, as a transaction, not that you can't build up the longevity, mm-hmm. But I think in B two B, there's just this natural. We're in a relationship with a yeah. vendor, um, and maybe that's part of it. But I, I was so glad that we could talk about that a little bit because I think it's fascinating, the mm-hmm. difference from just a psychological, social. It really is. <laughs> I'm waxing now. I'm kind of getting into into the weeds. But again, <laughs> we could talk about that for an entirely new and all the and a whole new, new podcast, whole new podcast. <laughs> um, what about so now we kind of kicked off talking about, um, you know, being women in marketing, working moms, and, and we're going to really end with that. But mm-hmm. to sort of to push us in that direction, you're doing something really exciting that also Luis Gonzalez, he was on um, one of the very early episodes of the podcast and had his um, partner on who he's worked with within human resources and and human capital for onboarding and bringing Mm -hmm. advocacy into the process. And I thought it was, it was fabulous. And you're doing something around that. And I'm really curious, what is it? How has it gone? And then more so the culture, because I know that that's really important to you. How has that impacted the culture for your organization? Yeah, I think like um, the the em- what we call the employee advocacy program is like it's just in our hands right now. It was in our and other teams' hands before, um, and indeed, what we want to do with it a little bit more is to improve our culture through that. Um, our team, uh, the consumer team, like they're they're spread all over the world, and we only see each other in meetings, and we only see each other when we need to see each other. So we kind of want to create a little bit more of a a community as it is. And, and advocacy is the perfect way to do it because there's a few things. What we want to do is, is get our word of mouth out again. Um, and by getting our word of mouth out, so really getting excited about we have an amazing threat intelligence team that writes amazing blogs on what our product does what threats are there how our customers can improve their security and we really want to get that out there and by doing that and really seeing the excitement for the product for our company it really creates a kind of a bond that we're really working towards that common goal again and because you know yourself like we've we've been working it's three years now it's over three years now that the majority of us have started working from home and culture in a company is just something that like before COVID I feel like very dramatic now but before COVID in our offices like Malwarebytes was like (laughs) the office to work for and it still is but like every company we're Everyone's a bit struggling um, how to really get that fantastic culture back, maybe in a slightly different way. But if yeah. you have a good culture in a company, you know, people are excited about their um, product. They're excited about their service. And so I think it, it just works both ways. I hope that makes sense. No, it, <laughs> In it, my head, it, it did. <laughs> It, it does. It makes perfect sense. And I agree with you that there has been a cultural shift, right? Mm-hmm. And B- BC, before COVID, um, yeah. there was this big push, right, on, mm-hmm. you know, corporate culture, but it was more with the tangibles, the in-person yeah. kind of things. Um, and I I worked, you know, for an organization um, 
fortune 10 company that it's like, yeah, there was the coffee shop in the building mm. and there was the workout studio and there were classes you could come. I mean, all of that centered around bringing people in. And yeah. then there was this, this shift. And I think it's uh, one other question on this, this employee advocacy program. And I love that you're calling it that. And mm -hmm. that is what you're doing. And I think it, it is something that can and should sit within the customer advocacy space, yeah. because we always talk about our internal customers, right? And mm -hmm. who better to represent and know how to get people engaged than, you know, those that sit on the advocacy program. I'm curious because my mind immediately went to, that's great. And we can get people engaged and we can do it in different ways. Like you said, exploring more virtual options, because I don't think that's going away. But I'm no. also curious if, if you've seen this or maybe it's too early, but wouldn't this be a great way to also just improve collaboration Yeah, ac across teams, uh, which is an area that I hear all the time when I, I have the luxury of mm -hmm. getting to talk to marketers and they're like, oh, okay, I got to break down the barriers and the silos. Mm -hmm. Man, an employee advocacy program sure seems like a nice way to to do it without having any ask attached to it. I completely agree. And that is indeed something like that is also very close to my heart, Cl uh, especially cross collaboration between teams. Like I've worked in the support team and I've worked in the marketing team and people are always complaining <laughs> between each other. So I think an advocacy program, you know, it, it, it will bring a little bit more cohesion and it is more difficult to break down these silos maybe when you're not in the office together but yeah i i agree i think that's 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 a very important objective for this employee program we haven't seen it yet because the program we've used before just didn't have a lot of options for really creating something like that whereas base who we're going with now does have that so and we only launched it now two weeks ago so we're we're a bit early in the process but yeah absolutely i think it's 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 good like i i'm 100 percent sure it's going to be a success in many different ways right it, it's going to have that whole tentacle effect right yeah. where it's mm -hmm. you know okay we're here and we're here and we're here and just that's why um it's something that is is on my list to take on as well and to do that right alongside i would actually love to see advocacy prof professionals make the shift that when if you come in and you're building an advocacy program you're building it for both internal customers yeah. and external customers i i would love to see that become a best practice so and, and, and taking that and and thinking about that we talked a little bit about you know covid and the, and the pandemic and it's nice to be be coming out of that but it's not the same. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of us marketers, we can attest to that. Um, In-person events are exciting, but trickier. The yeah. There's you know challenges with attendance. Um, mm -hmm. We're all up to our eyeballs. So finding time to carve out, um, we're just, we're so stressed. And you've done a lot with advocating for mental health awareness. That was one of the things that you and I bonded over mm -hmm. um, very early on and specifically women within marketing and women within tech. And talk to me, cause I know you have um, the women in, in tech group, but then mm -hmm. also why this is so important professionally and also why it's been so important to you personally. Yeah, professionally, like I, I'm an event organizer and, and I'm an activist. So I know how important it is to bring people together, especially bringing people together who are struggling. Um, because when you are struggling with mental health, um, however, you know, you know better, but you always think that you are alone or that you shouldn't bother people with your troubles because they already have enough on their plate. Whereas, and I'm going to I'm going to use the art of asking by Amanda Palmer again because I learned so much from that book. Is we assume so much that people are too busy to help, are too busy to ask something, are too busy to 
even listen, but everyone has their own issues and everyone would like to talk about them. And where BC, you know, you could see if somebody was struggling at work, be that professionally or personally. You could see it. I've cried at work. Uh, I'm an easy crier, but I cried at work. And somebody could actually see and give you a hug or give you some support or take you out for a coffee. We don't have that anymore. Um, I could be sitting here working away feeling miserable and nobody would notice it's something i wanted to talk about with our as we call them malware knots as well like how do you work you know when you're grieving or when you're in a difficult situation when your mental health isn't great how does it affect your work and how can we support those right now that are going through something like that because we don't see it anymore and we can't give those hugs and yeah you can do the whole virtual hugs and stuff but it's 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 a whole different thing so what i wanted to do is create safe spaces where we could talk about this stuff because to me for me it always starts with talking and what i've noticed and i'm yeah i'm i'm very proud that we could give these uh, safe spaces is that I've done a few mental health panels and we did a moms in tech panel uh, um, last week or two weeks ago. No, last week. And how open and honest people on the panel were. And then afterwards, the discussion just came loose. And I've had personal messages from people who wanted to be on the next panel because they saw that it's okay to talk about all of this. And you do have the support from your fellow workers even. And I think it's so important that we, like not every, don't get me wrong, not everyone's very open about it. But if I'm open about my struggles, if you're open about your struggles, the people who are not open are not open yet do feel supported in some way because they know that they're not the only one. And it's just so important to me to to talk about the difficult stuff. The, one of the things that we talked about in our Moms in Tech group was we talked about grief. We talked about miscarriages. We talked about stillbirths. We talked about everything. And these are topics that you would normally not hear on the work floor. So to me, opening up that conversation is so important. And I'm just... I'm just very grateful and, and just very happy that we have people in our company who are so open about this stuff. And yeah, what we do afterwards is that, you know, if somebody um, is struggling with something, you know, they can come to either, you know, the, the people who are in the panel or the people who are organizing it and we can have a chat, you know, and sometimes having a chat with even somebody that you don't really know is really helpful is helpful even more helpful than having it with mm. someone you do know mm -hmm. and that is that is not a knock on our support systems that we have but sometimes you're either not ready to have the conversation with yeah. those closest to you or you're able to just to share perspectives that you may not otherwise um and i and i love and you and i have talked about um i would love to be a part of the next you know group when you get that going yes. I would love to help you and I think there are a lot of you know maybe women that are listening to to this episode mm -hmm. that would like to be a part of that conversation um and you are absolutely correct I've you know shared bits and pieces I kind of subscribe to the theory not shocking personally and professionally <laughs> my job is to provide channels and platforms and opportunities yeah. for sharing of information mm -hmm. and if i have you know a very very small platform right but even if it's linkedin or, or whatever and i can share something that cla crashes these two worlds together and somebody and a lot of people have reached out and said i just needed to read that yeah there is nothing more mm -hmm. um, meaningful 
then then to see that and to know that this resonated and if it resonates with with one person so i i'm just very much in awe please keep doing that i will yeah. and i will help in any way that mm -hmm. that you I will really let appreciate me that. um and as we kind of you know wrap up today i ask the, i always ask the same question about kind of you know advice you know work advice but specifically since we're on this topic about you know moms in tech or just women in tech what mm -hmm. what is the one piece of advice that you would give to um the moms the women you know working in in, in marketing today well, it's, it's the classic, um, you don't have to have it all, you know, whatever you do, you're an amazing mom, whatever you do, you're an amazing professional. If something is not going the way you think it's going, it's fine. You just regroup and continue. Um, one of the things that I, I, I struggle with is mom guilt. And with that, of course, imposter syndrome. So, um, it's okay to not have it all. Like, it's okay if, you know, your laundry is piling up for three days because you've been very busy at work. It's okay. Don't beat yourself up over it. It will be handled. And now I can say this, but I do need to really take that on as well because I do tend to forget this, these things. And the other thing is as well is... um. And this has more to do with like the imposter syndrome that I would have as well. For instance, I don't have a degree. Um, and that is something together with the whole guilt, mom guilt thing is, is something that is, is, yeah, just comes up every now and again. I, I watched Queer Eye yesterday and I saw, I don't know if you've watched it or if you're a fan or no, not like since that. it's original, it's original launch. Oh, Okay. Bobby Burke said yesterday, and I, I kind of really liked it, and I, I do really, really want to take that on. And I think it, it fits perfectly with the whole being a mom in tech, being a parent in tech, being a woman in tech, being anyone in tech is, he says, just because your journey is different, it doesn't mean your destination will not be success. And I think that's one of the things I'm going to live by right now as much as I can. I like that. I like that very much. And uh, it, as a recovering perfectionist, uh, <laughs> I always say, you know, work in progress, but the whole, I, I've given up on trying to, we're never going to have it all. Um, no. Those three words drive me nuts, to be honest, yeah. because I don't even know what, what that what that really means. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've kind of toyed around with, and I, and I found over the last few years, everything that has gone on and not just dealing with, with the pandemic, but some significant things with, with both of my children, actually, mm -hmm. I have decided that you just have to learn, redefine all. And yeah. what does all mean to you? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I think all has become synonymous with the society like what does all mm -hmm. actually mean and what does it actually mean to you um and that has been very cathartic for me and in fact I actually write it down and it changes it changes all the time yeah like what you know what does all mean to me this year what does all mean to mm -hmm. me you know this week or this month um so I guess that that's my that's my two cents of just how to kind of move through and I've dealing with anxiety. I've been open about that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lifelong struggle. And the snowball yeah. effect mm -hmm. is, is very real. And so I find ways like to stop, stop the snowball. And some of that is just unpacking and reprioritizing um, when I do have some moments of clarity. So that's great advice. I think that we should good advice. I, I would, I can't wait to partner with you and do more with some of these panels because I think it's fabulous. I want to thank you because you've given so much wonderful insight into professionally, into marketing and your journey. And I, I took away a bunch of notes on things that, that I can apply immediately professionally, but then also just as always for being you 
and being no, open. Thank you so much. And you do. And honest. <laughs> you're just, you're a delight. So thank you so much for joining us. And it's been a, it's just been a pleasure. Um, it's been a pleasure from my side as well. Always. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Stay tuned. You know, there's always exciting follow-ups after the episodes, but until then, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, and we will talk to you next time. Take care. Thanks again for joining us. Don't forget to follow me, Allison Bukowski, on LinkedIn, where you'll find information about upcoming episodes, Q&A sessions, and live panel discussions with our guests. Customer X-Files is brought to you by PeerSpot, the authority on enterprise technology. The PeerSpot buying intelligence platform is where tech professionals go to get the most reliable information on enterprise tech so they can be sure that what they buy is exactly what they need. Powered by a community of over 650,000 enterprise tech professionals who share expertise, PeerSpot provides in-depth reviews, buyer's guides, online forums, and more giving professionals the confidence to make the right buying decision. For more info, check out marketing.peerspot.com. And to keep getting this show in your podcast feed, every time a new episode drops, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>